Okay, my friends, welcome once again to another episode here, the Red Delta Project Podcast and live feed Q&A here on the RDP YouTube channel, Facebook, Twitch, Twitter, and all other RDP social media accounts. As always, I'm Matt Schifferly, helping you to be fit and live free by taking a fundamental approach to diet and exercise. As always, this week's episode is all uh, helped and sponsored by the RDP Library, but we're also going to be referencing several pieces of equipment that are linked down below that are going to be in line with today's topic that are going to help you essentially stay as pain-free as possible. Because the name of the game is resiliency for today's episode. Because at the end of the day, pain is weakness. There is no shortcut around pain. Whenever we're in pain, we are leaving progress on the table. You're not going to be as strong. You're not going to build as much muscle. You're going to have a harder time performing. It can have ramifications and uh, ripple effects towards being able to burn calories and manage weight. Essentially, pain is one of those things that not only is just uncomfortable, but is just this really cancerous thing that can really hurt all of our progress in fitness. And a couple of the ideas on dealing with pain in our fitness culture are really undermining your ability to actually overcome it. There's a lot of mental uh, attitudes and approaches that we have out there that may seem to make sense in the short term, but ultimately are not going to be the long-term solution and can sometimes even undermine your future further progress. So as always, I'll be answering your questions about that as well as anything else that you want to come on and uh, ask as well. But let's jump right into it. So let's get really on a good foundation. Why is pain so detrimental? Because there's all these ideas about how pain is something that uh, makes us tough and it makes us macho. I even used to have a t-shirt that I won at a fair as a pull-up contest. I said, pain is weakness leaving the body kind of you know, macho, machismo uh, type of attitudes and stuff. But the fact of the matter is whenever we're in pain, our body's physiological, emotional, and sometimes neural uh, self-defense mechanisms kick in because our body and mind and everything has evolved to be more about self-preservation than actually progress. And whenever we have a fork in the road of, well, we can continue go moving forward and making progress and getting stronger and faster and better, or we can be more safe and comfortable and being able to uh, help ourselves just live longer, we're going to default to the latter every single time. It takes a lot of self-motivation and a lot of kind of uh, mental trickery to override these self-preservation techniques. This is why so much of the methods that we use in grind style calisthenics, especially that I'll be talking about today, are all about making us feel as safe and as comfortable as possible when we're training. Because the safer you feel, the more comfortable you feel, and the less at risk you feel, the easier it's going to be to push your body to a much higher level and get far better progress. But the moment your body and mind start feeling like, oh, we're kind of at risk here, it subdues a lot of our ability to essentially push ourselves to a higher level. And this can take many different forms. It can take a loss of just motivation to work out in general, a loss of the ability to push ourselves harder in our workouts, a loss of the desire to uh, make progress, that growth mindset really can get hampered, where instead of looking for ways that we can do things better, we're just trying to play it safe and be like, well, how do I do squats without hurting my knees? That sort of idea. So pain is really the mother of all inhibitors when it comes to our health and fitness, which is why, one, we want to keep it away from ourselves as much as humanly possible. And two, when we have it, we want to fix it and get rid of it as quickly as possible as well. And that's largely what some of these tips are all about. And we want to address some of the messages in our fitness culture that actually discourage you from actually getting better from these th sorts of things. So let's jump right into it here. We'll uh, take a look at some of our questions that come up as well here. But the first thing that goes a long way at helping you avoid unnecessary pain and injury is just getting out of this whole idea that stress is the point of our physiological training. And there's this idea that the way that the body gets bigger and faster and stronger is we subject it to stress 
and we essentially kind of have a little bit of a, a pre-injury, if you will. We break ourselves down. We tear muscle and we break it down and stuff. And then through the recovery process from that quote injury or the breaking down, that's how we have super compensation and we come back bigger, faster, and stronger. However, this is an attitude that we strongly want to question for several reasons. One is that a lot of the science just doesn't bear this out. There are plenty of examples where we can take a population or a, a body, uh, either human or animal or whatnot in the research labs, break it down, beat it up, really stress it. And yes, there is more of the seemingly things that we want, like muscle protein synthesis and uh, things like that. But there doesn't necessarily always mean there's going to be a net gain. And that was the assumption that we were always going off of is like, oh my gosh, these people got the absolute snot beat out of them during this workout. And all the markers that seem to indicate that their body's getting built back bigger, faster, and stronger are really prevalent. So therefore, you know, pain equals or stress equals gain and stuff. But that's not necessarily the case because when we are in super recovery mode, that doesn't necessarily mean we're in super build ourselves up mode. Think of like if you took a car and you smashed it up against guardrails and hit it in the wall and stuff. And then you brought it to the shop and they're like, oh my gosh, we're doing so much work on this car and we're putting money into it and they're working on it. They got five mechanics on it. Surely it's going to be faster and it's gonna be awesome and it's gonna be a great, you know, better car than it was before. And then you get it like six weeks later and they're like, okay, here's your car. And you're like, but it looked just like it did before the accident. Like, how come it's not faster? How come it's not better? How come it's not, you know, better wheels and all this other stuff. It's like, well, why would we build it to be better? We just spent all that time building it to just fix it. And that's usually what ends up happening most of the time when we're building our body back from recovery is we're not trying to get our body to be better. We're trying to get our body to be just normal again. So when we've got this attitude of I'm trying to beat myself up, I'm trying to stress my body. That's the point of workouts. That's kind of like playing a chicken race you know, two cars driving towards each other. And it's the one who drives off and flinches first is called chicken, right? The, you, you see these all in, you know, the eight, 1980s, you know, movies and stuff like uh, Footloose and stuff and playing chicken with each other. Well, it's kind of like that, but the oncoming vehicle is a train. You cannot outwin mother nature. You can always put in more stress and more time and more energy, but mother nature does not flinch. So the only two options you can possibly have from this attitude of the point of my workouts is to basically stress out my body as much as possible is you're either going to crash or you're going to quit. You're not going to win this one. You're going to have two bad outcomes sooner or later. So by getting out of that mentality, we stop playing the chicken race and realizing that yes, stress and breaking down the body to some degree is part of the process. Absolutely. I'm not saying you can avoid it. But I'm saying that's not the point of training. Your body is not going to be bigger, faster, and stronger because you beat the snot out of it in your workouts. And this idea is very prevalent in our fitness culture because a lot of our things that become very popular when it comes to diet and exercise seem to just be things that are really hard to do. You take any type of program, and I know a lot of coaches are like, everybody wants the easy way. Everybody wants the magic pill. That is blatantly false in my experience because I've built my career largely about how do we make this easier? How do we make shortcuts? How do we train people without as much time and energy and blood, sweat, and tears? And believe me, no one wants to hear it. No one wants it. I go to parties and people are like, oh, I want to get in shape and stuff like that. I'm like, okay, here's some simple, easy, basic things you can do that aren't going to put too much stress on mind, body, and lifestyle. Nobody wants it. It's a real hard sell. Why? Because we've been indoctrinated into this idea that pain equals gain. That if something's easy, something's comfortable, and something's relatively easy to do for on your lifestyle, then it can't possibly be very effective. However, I could make a program and call it, well, let's say it's a challenge and put in all sorts of like Ukrainian death march, you know, with skulls and crossbones and people with blood running down their face and everything on the poster and stuff. It's like, are you up for the challenge? And have social media testimonials about how it was derived from, you know, not even the Navy SEALs, but the ultra secret Navy SEALs would use this and everything as hardcore, badass, rah, rah. It'll sell like hotcakes. It'll sell like hotcakes. Why? Because that's what sells. People have been 
indoctrinated in this idea that blood, sweat, and tears is what changes the body. And it's not. It's not what changes the body. It's a stimulus that changes the body. And yes, really extreme stimuli does come with a fair degree of stress. You're not going to run a marathon sitting on the couch. You're not going to become a champion power lifter just, you know, lifting light weights and, you know, stopping as soon as you get a little burn in the muscle. You're going to have to push your body. I'm not denying that. But when we make the pain itself the objective of our training, now we're playing that chicken race with the train. And the only outcome you can possibly hope for is some degree of success, maybe, because you're going to get some sim stimulus from it, but eventually you're going to quit and you're going to crash. So the answer to this is you then just flip it around and recognize that the point of training is to teach the body, not beat it up. You're trying to functionally teach yourself how to perform at a higher level. And yes, the more you go up, the more stress you're going to have. But if you go after it with the idea of I'm trying to teach it at a, a reasonable pace, I'm trying to educate my body, I'm not just beating myself up for the sake of beating myself up, then it becomes a lot more manageable on mind, body, and lifestyle because it's about educating your body. It's about teaching your body what you want it to be able to do. And that's a completely different scenario because you can then use your body in alignment with what resources you have, your mind, your energy level, your, and your time, what you're feeling like today. All of my training and most of my books is all about working with your resources. So if you walk into a gym and you're not feeling very good, you don't have much time and you don't have much energy, you're not going to push yourself through a workout. You just don't have the capacity for. Because when we are working beyond our capacity, that's when we get hurt. That's when we have injuries happen. It's not because we do a particular exercise or we're pushing ourselves really hard. It's because we're working beyond our capacity. And that's not a good recipe for success. So we've got to ditch the whole, you know, the point of workouts is to stress my body. No, stress is just an outcome. It's a side effect of it. But that's not what changes our body. If we go into the workout going, okay, I'm trying to teach my body how to be better at pull-ups, how to do a few more reps, how to work with a better sense of control and stuff, that's going to be a whole different ballgame. Not only is that far more effective for getting you what you want out of your workouts, but it's a heck of a lot less stressful on the body. Let's get to some questions on here as well. People coming on in, Matt C saying, have you ever uh, been doing weighted calisthenics lately? I do a little bit. I don't do a whole heck of a lot uh, just because I've been really, especially lately going on much more of a progressive calisthenics kick, uh, especially because it's just easier for me. Like I got to get the weight vest, I got the plates, the Kinsui vest, and I've got the equipment and all this stuff versus I can get on the floor and just move a few inches to my, my dominant arm. You know, it's just a lot easier for me to use the progressive uh, calisthenic stuff. But uh, for weighted stuff, usually my go-to is um, weighted pull-ups and dips. I mean, that's my go-to way to do weighted stuff. If I'm doing that, then I'll just do weighted pull-ups and dips. And that's about the bulk of the weighted stuff that I do. Sometimes I'll hold a dumbbell or a plate or something for some weighted uh, leg work as well, but uh, haven't been doing a whole lot of it. In fact, for the whole grind style calisthenics approach, remember there's four diff disciplines in grind style calisthenics. We've got progressive calisthenics, weighted calisthenics, suspension calisthenics, and isometrics. And kind of the perspective that I've been using in my own workouts is that progressive calisthenics and suspension work is like my main bread and butter. That's like 90% of what I do. And then the weighted stuff and the isometrics is like the supplemental thing that I play with once in a while. Now, of course, these things are always changing around a little bit and it might be different a month from now. Ask me a month from now, you may get a different answer, but that's kind of the way I've been doing things now is almost all uh, the progressive and suspension calisthenics and the weighted and the isometric stuff is like 10, maybe 20% of what I've been doing. Master Dave coming on saying, hey, Matt, love to hear your thoughts on how to properly warm up for a workout. Oh, very good. Excellent. Uh, so yes, warming up is good and crucial, but a lot of people get it horribly wrong because their warm up is terribly out of alignment with, with, with what they're actually trying to do. So first and foremost, remember that most people do not need to warm up for a workout. They need to warm up to recover from being sedentary for several days. So if I've been sitting in the car driving for five straight hours out to the mountains or whatnot, 
and then I'm going to get a workout in. I'm going to war- do more of a warm up, but it's not to get ready to work out. It's because I've been sitting in a car. I'm tight. I'm stiff. I'm sore. You know, all these sorts of things. And that's usually the reality that most people have for warm ups is they need to recover from being sedentary, not prepare themselves for exercise. Second is your warm up should be in alignment with what you're about to do. Okay, so I can run on a treadmill for 15 minutes, do another five minutes of foam rolling, you know, and stretch out and get my lats on and everything like that. And I'm like, okay, great. Now I'm all warmed up. Jump up on the pull-up bar and my body's going to be like, what the hell is this? You're, you're not warmed up at all for this. And that's unfortunately what ends up happening a lot of the times is that we're, quote, warming up, thinking we need to do warm-up exercises and stuff. And then when we go and work out, we're not in the slightest bit prepared for it because the warm-up had very little resemblance from the actual workout itself. So the best way to prepare ourselves for a workout is to do lighter versions of the very things you're planning to do. So if you're going to go for a run, light and easy jogging. When I was a bike racer, I would do a nice and easy lap around the course before hammering myself around the course. If you're going to be doing strength training, do lighter versions of the exercises you're about to do. If you're going to be doing anything that requires a big range of motion, you start using that range of motion to a shorter degree, and then you ease in. Like with Taekwondo, you know, we've got our high kicks and everything, so I'll do lower side kicks and stuff. And you can do exercises that are very similar. So I I might do like a really deep horse stance and shift side to side or sitting stance, as we call it, to warm up my hips and stuff. But you're not going to find me doing hardly any, quote, warm-up for any of my workouts. You're just going to see me just jump into the workout and starting off gradual and slow because that's the best way to prepare ourselves for the work to come much of the time. You also want to be looking at just anything that needs to be addressed in the moment. So sometimes you might have a tight back or hips or something that you might want to stretch a little bit and so forth. But that's the big thing that you want to have is you want to just basically start doing a lighter version of what you're about to do. And that's the most applicable way to warm up for anything. And if you're doing things that have very little resemblance to what you're about to do, you're not really warming up for what you're going to do. You're warming up for whatever that thing is. So if I run on the treadmill for 15 minutes, I'm warming up to go running, not to go and do calisthenics. And as always, I'm a big fan of listen to the body. And this also goes along with building up a pain-free body. And Use whatever abilities you have in the moment. My training is very adaptive. It's very intuitive. I never give people, this is how many sets and reps you should be doing at this weight or anything like that, because you're always going to be a kind of a different person from one workout to the next. So if you come in and you're tight and you're stiff and you're tired and you're like, oh boy, it's like, yeah, we're going to ease in a lot easier, maybe even do an easier workout in general. I'm not going to just throw you to the wolves with the hard and fast stuff. But if you come in and you're ready to rock and roll and be like, okay, loosen up here, do a little crawling movements, make sure, okay, you good? Yeah, okay, let's go. Let's just go. Yeah. We've got this idea that exercise is supposed to be this really big deal. Like it's this really foreign thing for the body to be doing. And that's a big problem because if just simply doing a squat or push-ups and pull-ups feels like this weird foreign thing for us to be doing, that means we need to be doing more of those things. It should be second nature to move and use our body. It shouldn't be something that requires a whole lot of preparation unless you're using your body to a more extreme level. So start off easy of what you're going to do, and that will be a good way to to jump right in. Crystal Ball is saying, what are your thoughts on deadlifting while having lower back injury? Well, always is a, you know, let pain be your guide kind of thing. Um, And it depends on what the injury is too. So this goes along with what I was going to discuss later, but we'll jump into it right now, is when you have pain, okay, that's bad. I know it, it may seem a little you know, like, well, duh, Matt, you know, thanks for the tip. It's like, no, seriously, pain is bad. Fix it. Understand what it is. Fix it. Don't work around it. If you don't have to, you know, people like, how do I do this? Even though I've got this pain, you get rid of the pain. That is the best answer you can possibly have. Find someone who can assess and diagnose it and fix the damn thing as quickly as humanly possible. But there are so many ideas that are just I guess society, not even fitness culture, that's all about how do I work around this pain? Ideally, you shouldn't have to. You fix it. Well, okay, well, if I've got this pain, well, how do I figure that out? Get it diagnosed in person, preferably, because Google's a terrible place to diagnose things. 
I get questions all the time. I got this pain in my shoulder, got this pain in my wrist, got this pain in my knee. What do I do? Answer's always the same. Find someone who can take a look at it for you because it's a guessing game otherwise. Google or asking me, you know, an email and stuff like that, I'm guessing. I don't know. I'll just throw a dart at a wall with a bunch of things. It's um tendinosis. Uh, no, bursitis. So well, it could be both. Oh, whatever kind of thing. It's literally just that. It's a pure guessing game. So you've got a lower back injury, fix it. You know, and if someone's like, well, you shouldn't deadlift with that injury, then you don't deadlift. You know, maybe you can find some other things like an isometric or some bridges or something. But yeah, sometimes, and this is the thing we don't like to admit, sometimes with an injury, you're just going to be losing ground. Bottom line, you know, it's like, well, I've got this shoulder issue uh, and I can't do any sort of, you know, pushing or anything with my arms. What do I do? I'm like, what are you going to do? What, you're going to lose gains is what you're going to do. <laughs> you're going to get weaker and you're going to get smaller until it's fixed. That's what you're going to do. Yeah, that's, I know that's not what we want to hear. It sucks to hear that thing, but until it's fixed, that's the path you're going to be forced to take. So fix it as quickly as possible. So you have as little of that detriment as you can, which is again, why you want to see someone in person and doctor, physical therapist, don't, you know, see someone who's just going to be like, well, take two Advil and, you know, just avoid pain kind of thing. Preferably find somebody who can take a look at it and be like, this is exactly what's wrong. And this is how we fix it. I've got a good friend out here, a chiropractor, who I refer to people all the time. Why? Because he x-rays people. When folks are like, oh, God, this shoulder and this back, it just won't go away. I'm like, go see Dr. Courtney. Why? Because he's going to x-ray you. He's going to look physically at your spine and be like, that vertebrae should not be looking like that. <laughs> That's your problem right there. It's not, well, it could be this or that. It's like that. We can see physically what is broken. And now here's how we fix it. That's the best case scenario on how we deal with pain. And then you just got to bite the bullet and do whatever it takes to fix it. And that may not always be possible. Sometimes it's like, well, I've got arthritis in my shoulder. I'm like, yeah, yeah, sorry. Not a lot you could do with that. So then we look into other exercises, other methods. But there is always the possibility, the real possibility that, yeah, you're not going to be as strong as you used to be without that injury. You're not going to have as much muscle built up. So get what you can out of that. So when you've got lower back issues, it's not even just so much that you've got pain, like, okay, I can do this deadlift, but there's no pain. Also assess risk too. So we want to keep our training relatively low risk. And this is one of the big reasons why I'm not a big fan of taking barbell lifts or machine lifts to failure. Because in my experience, just as a coach for over 20 years now, that the things that lock you more in place tend to have the greater risk of something going pop, snap, or zing when we get to the edge of our limit of how much we can do that thing. Now, if I'm doing push-ups or kettlebells or dumbbells or something, and I start to lose it, I can dump the dumbbells. I can just lay on the floor if I'm doing push-ups. Like if my technique starts to falter, I'm still okay because it's not like you're going great and then suddenly you hit failure and everything just stops. You have this period sometimes where the quality of your technique starts to erode. And whenever we're in a situation where the quality of our technique erodes, if the risk of injury is going up, I don't go there. It's that simple. And in my experience, deadlifts are one of those exercises. I just tell people, do not take deadlifts to failure. It's just not worth it because the back starts to round. You start to lose that lumbar stability, uh, you, less of a hip drive. The bar starts walking away from the shins just a little bit. There's all these little things that tend to happen under fatigue. So that's why I tell people just don't ever really bring it to failure very much. You could go and push your hamstrings to obliteration a hundred other ways as a finisher, you know, GHDs or table bridges or hamstring curls. There's a hundred other things you could do that are a lot safer to push yourself to that limit. So avoid the things that put you in that precarious position. Because again, we don't want to be playing that chicken race. We want to be saying, if things start going sideways, I'm still fine. I'm still plenty resilient. I'm probably not going to have much risk of injury. That's the thing that's going to be easier to push yourself on. And probably the thing that's going to help you build more muscle. All right, Master Don's come. Uh, <clears throat> that's a warm up. Sorry, got that already. Joseph Bell is saying, hey, Matt, what was a good exercise for the hamstring on glutes instead of bridges? So bridges I use as a very broad term. You know, that's a, lots of different types of things. But generally, there's 
types of bridges of there's back bridge where your hips, where your back is extending back. And then there's the hip bridge. And the hip bridge is where it's primarily coming from your hips. So it, it kind of depends. When you say bridges, are you talking about primarily back bridges? Because then maybe you could do the hip bridges. Uh, but uh, you also have like GHD and uh, hip extension benches if you've got access to that. You can also use just any sort of deadlifting motion with other tools. You've got uh, barbells, dumbbells, bands, uh, logs, small children, that sort of thing. Uh, basically, anything that's extending your hip, anything that gets your hips extending is going to be using your glutes and your hamstrings. So that type of movement is going to be a good way to go about it. But the other thing that you need to uh, pay attention to is how well you're using your glutes and your hamstrings just all the time anyway. Because remember, whenever we're looking at a particular muscle group, it's good to say, okay, what exercise works this? Okay, great. We got glutes and hamstrings. We got deadlifts. We got kettlebell swings. We've got bridges, hip bridges. Great. Awesome. Good. But the real marker of how to truly develop a muscle to a higher degree is to use that muscle as much as possible all the time. <laughs> So are you using your glutes and hamstrings with your lunges and your squats when you're walking, when you're going upstairs, when you're hiking, when you're riding your bike, like any time you can use those muscles more with all exercises, that's going to be a lot more effective than, hey, I found this cool new exercise that works the glutes and the hamstrings. Use it all the time. I got that, sorry, back and forth. Trying with a new setup here, folks. It may work well, but uh, I'll get the camera here, computer there, and a little back and forth here. Dr. Barr is saying, hey, Matt, uh, do you really need to do straight sets to build muscle? I've seen people doing uh, EMOM every minute on the minute, uh, training with great results. What are your thoughts about this? Yeah, absolutely. So the bottom line is, remember, I was talking earlier about creating a stimulus for building muscle and strength. You just need that stimulus. That's what I talk about in my book, Micro workouts. When you know the stimulus that you're going after, you can literally work out any way that you want. You can train any way that you want. A lot of times in our fitness culture, we're told if you want a particular result, you have to do this kind of workout or you have to train it this way. And that's blatantly false. That's like me saying, if you want protein in your diet, you have to eat chicken. There's a million ways you can do this. So for example, like we're, what, are, what is the objective here? Sorry, I, I just <laughs> um, build muscle, right? So we've just got to work the capacity of the muscle progressively. We just got to work the muscle to the point where we're feeling like, oh man, that muscle is really burning and I'm really, oh boy, that's about all a muscle had. I don't care how you work out to get there, okay? Imam, you know, every 30 seconds, straight sets, circuits, compound drop sets, volume training, low volume training. You can train any way, shape, or form because the stimulus that you're after does not depend on any particular workout style. And it's like, again, it's like saying, I don't want to be naked. Well, you've got to wear a t-shirt. There's a million different ways you could not be naked, right? It's like, there's lots of different ways you can do things. Now, there are some things that are standards just because a lot of people find that's just the easiest, most simple way to go about it, like straight sets. But there's no need to confine yourself or limit yourself to any one particular training style. Because as long as you're challenging the work capacity of that muscle, the stimulus for building muscle will largely be there. And you can do that any way that you like. So have flexibility. Do things your way. Emma K saying, hey, Matt, what about reducing pain? Very good question. Awesome. I have a 10-year-old shoulder injury that is now getting better with training. But my wrist hurts. Uh, at all movements of the day. Any advice? Okay, so this is an outstanding question because it leads me to my second point when we have pain is always remember that pain is mother nature's way of telling us we're screwing something up much of the time. Now, I don't, I don't mean to criticize you too much there, Emma, but as someone who's had pain throughout my entire body, almost my entire life, this is something I wish I knew back in the day because I've had pain pretty much everywhere. A lot of it chronically for years and years and years, and it would come and go and everything. But the lesson that pain can teach us is that something is usually out of alignment. So if I've got wrist pain, if I got shoulder pain, and I know it's not an injury, like arthritis or something that's structurally wrong in there that needs to be then dealt with and fixed, then I'm like, okay, something I'm doing is messing this up. There's a misalignment somewhere. And this is why I went and saw my 
friend and the chiropractor, uh, you know, Dr. Courtney, because I've had a particular lot of lower back and hip pain for years and years and years and years. And I'm stretching and I'm rolling and I'm rolling and, 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 and then he finally looked at me and he's like, yeah, it's in your neck. Because again, he took an x-ray and he's like, yeah, see how your neck vertebrae is like this? That's not right. You need to fix that. You know, he gave me exercises and fixed it. Now, no more pain, you know, even with the same things that were causing pain. So something is wrong for you, Emma, probably as long as, unless you're like, yeah, I've got five pins in my wrist from a, you know, car accident or something, I'm assuming, but something is wrong when we experience pain from something and we need to learn what that is. So a lot of times that means that other muscles are not doing their job. A lot of times in the upper body, that means our back isn't working very well. This is a big source of pain for people. Wrists, elbows, shoulders, lower back. A lot of times it's something in the back going on because our back is like our foundation. It's our stabilizers. It's the thing that gives us our foundation for almost the stability and control and alignment of our entire upper body. So when our back is weak and underactive, which is very, very common, even for athletes, even for weightlifters, uh, then yeah, you're going to have much more stress in the joints. And until you get things engaged and working back again, then it's always going to be there. So this is where having, again, someone to get eyes on the situation who can look at what you're doing, who can see what you're doing. I had a a trainer the other day come in and she's working with me for calisthenics training. She's like, I'm just not strong on pushups. I'm just not feeling this. And my wrists are kind of tight and tender. And I'm like, well, let me see a pushup. And she goes down and I'm like, yep, there you go. Push up hunch. You know, every time, you know, that's very common. You give me a hundred people doing pushups. You're probably going to have the push up hunch out of 98 of them. It's very, very common, very prevalent because we're not stabilizing, pulling our shoulders down and back when we're doing our push-ups, And that just creates this cascade ripple effect of all sorts of problems that compromise the alignment and stability of everything in your upper body, which is often, again, showing up as stress in our joints. So get, getting back to your uh, question here, Emma, is it's time for a little more detective work. That's all. When we have pain, especially chronic pain, we want to figure out why. Don't just try and work around it. Don't just, you know, well, if I take a bottle of Advil and, you know, warm up for 30 minutes and stuff, then I can do push-ups without pain. No, we're not supposed to have pain, folks. We should eliminate it as much as humanly possible. And don't be one of these, well, once you turn 45 or once you do this, and so, I, my knees were shot to hell before I learned to drive, okay? Age is no barrier or protection against injury. There's kids in grade school now getting surgery on their elbows, shoulders, and knees from injuries from playing sports. You know, when people are like, oh, remember when you were younger, you know, and your body was so resilient and you never got hurt and you could do it. I'm like, no, I was never like that. I was always in pain when I was younger. I was always injured. I was always icing this and warm and heating that and everything constantly throughout my entire younger life, you know, because I was not good at doing the things. It was my fault. I had poor back activation. I had poor technique. I was doing things very poorly. And that pain was Mother Nature's way of telling me, hey, Matt, you're screwing things up. So MK is falling up, back up. Uh, oops, sorry, excuse me. That was the same question, my bet. Alexis, Alex N saying, hey, Matt, cannot seem to improve on my pull-ups. Yes, even though I trained for 10 years, max pull-ups is 13. Congratulations. That's a hell of a lot more than most people can do. Uh, my body looks like I can do 25 at least, but I cannot back it up. <laughs> I know how that is. Uh, how to increase the number. So always look at improving reps to improve the number of reps, my friends. When we are looking for more from our body, we need to improve the quality if we want to improve the quantity. So there's several ways you can do this. Uh, the first of which is recognize how your technique is eroding with your uh, 13 that you can do. So what's going on now, just in my experience of being a calisthenics coach for nearly 15 years. And so I would bet money, your back activation is not very good. Do you feel your lats burning with the fire of a thousand suns when you hit that 13th rep or does it feel like meh? Yeah, I guess they're on sort of, you know, man, my biceps are going crazy. I feel it all in my shoulders. Yeah, that's what's going on. Many people fail to really get a lot of activation in their back. 
This is where the isometrics comes into play, where the tension exercises and grind style calisthenics come into play. The second your hands touch that pull-up bar, you should feel your whole back light right up like crazy. And this is a, a big shortcoming because your lats are a huge muscle group and they're a prime driver for pull-ups. And if they're not activating very well, if you're not getting a lot of tension in them, you're never going to be much stronger in pull-ups. There's nothing you can do about it. But once you get those suckers lit up like a Christmas tree, oh, yeah, 20 reps is not going to be hard for you at all. Now, am I guessing? Absolutely. I'm base, basing it on guesses and assumptions. But that's kind of what you do in this industry. You know, you, you see 100 people who have poor push-ups because of the push-up hunch. You're going to bet that the next person probably has a push-up hunch. Same thing with pull-ups. You know, when pull, doing pull-ups, I see those shoulders hunch up. I don't see the back. Uh, lit up very much. So that's where I would go first to take a look at it. And second is, again, check out that technical erosion. How are you eroding your technique on those last few repetitions? Usually it's range of motion. Are your legs kicking up? That's another good sign of a poor back activation when the legs are kind of kicking up in front of you. Uh, are you breathing? Because remember, when we hit failure with a technique, folks, it's always a good thing to ask ourselves, failure of what? You know, ideally, we're thinking failure of a muscle group that's just not contracting as much because that is what training to a muscular failure is, is just no longer being able to hold as much tension in the muscle. That's what muscular failure is. But a lot of times we hit failure of a different type. It could be mental failure. It could be cardiovascular failure. I was training a couple this morning and they would just keep hitting this wall because they're breathing like this. You know, and when you do that, now you're hitting cardiovascular limitations. Your muscles are still fine, but you're barely breathing. So you're just gassing out after a few repetitions or five or six reps. And suddenly your body's like, I'm done, even though your muscles are still relatively fresh. So that's the other thing to question is what, what type of failure are you hitting? Al Painter, it is so good to see you, my friend. I hope you're keeping the rubber side down. Mm. Hope you're doing good. Hope you're riding well. Anyway, saying, how about this one, coach? My race is a uh, paddling leg of uh, a sup running duathlon. Oh boy, good, goodness. Uh, stand up paddle boarding. That's interesting. What recommendation do you have for balancing proper gym, body gym time with time on the paddle board? Uh, thanks. So I kind of addressed this a little bit last week where I was saying, you know, sometimes we're just going to train tired. When we're balancing multiple activities that we're doing, we sometimes think, okay, I want to have a lot of energy and time available for this and a lot of energy and time for this other thing and a lot of time and energy for, it's like, no, eventually, especially when you're training for races and stuff, you're just going to get to the point where you're like, I'm not going to have that much available. I'm just going to be training a little tired, I guess. So intuitive and adaptive training comes into handy with this one, you know, go out paddle boarding, go out and riding. Uh, in training and stuff, but sometimes it may make sense to just kind of have one dial down a little bit. So if you're doing hardcore calisthenics training, and you're like, well, I've got this you know, duathlon going on with a paddle boarding. I need to spend more time on the paddle board. Okay. So downshift your calisthenics training for a couple times a week, a full body workout, maybe just a simple push pull squat, a couple micro workouts just to keep things going and spend most of the time on the paddle board. You've got a race coming up, so just train for several weeks. And then once the race is done, then you shift back into hardcore calisthenics training. So you can adjust things. Or I would say to a degree, just train as much as you want in both. And when you notice that one is starting to get compromised due to the time and energy uh, investment in the other, you just back off whichever one's not totally important for you right now. You know, to a degree, uh, you know, play chicken a little bit <laughs> with that race. See what how much training you can withstand. Because you, I think a big mistake a lot of people make is it like, oh, I'm doing two things. I've got to really play a conservative with my time and energy. Yeah, you, maybe. But at the same time, it's like, yeah, sure. Train both every day. See what happens. You may surprise yourself. You may find, well, that first week or two was kind of rough. But, you know, actually, it wasn't so bad. I can do both. I mean, hell, I had a friend back in Vermont. She would run 20 miles, come home for lunch, and then go up Mount Mansfield, which is the tallest mountain in Vermont. And Mount Mansfield is a mountain that would kick most people's butt just that. And she built herself up, her work capacity, to the point where she could do both in a single day. And then the next day, she'd go run a 10K and stuff. Remember, our work capacity is also heavily determined by our physical conditioning. So if you've got the physical conditioning for it, 
yeah, do, do a lot of both. You may not even be testing your capacity all that much. Uh, Dr. Barr is saying once again, hey, Matt, uh, you are against the idea of exercise being important only if you do a certain amount of it. Right. But isn't there a threshold of volume and intensity to trigger muscle growth? No, absolutely not. So this is funny uh, because, well, it, it, yes and no. Yes and no. I spoke a little too quickly. But yes and no. Remember that your ability to trigger growth does not come from how much work you do. It comes from creating a delta. Yeah. I know. That's why I named it the way I did and stuff. You create a difference in what you're doing from what is normal to you. So there was a study, I just put a little short on the YouTube channel. I think YouTube took it, uh, it's like a minute and a half. So maybe not YouTube, but Instagram for sure, where they took a study and they literally had the participants in the study do a dumbbell curl three times a week. That was it. They're like, here's your dumbbell. Here, one curl. Whoop, whoop. That was the whole workout three times a week. And they built muscle and strength because that's all they needed to do to create a delta. They weren't doing hardly anything with their arm as far as hard work. So just that was enough to create a stimulus. Now, was it much of a stimulus? Was it much growth and strength? Probably not. Would they have created more if they did more? Absolutely. But remember, there's no minimal threshold. All you need to do is take whatever you're normally used to, which in many cases is maybe nothing or very little, and, up, and upgrade that to some degree. And if you have that, Literally one dumbbell curl can create a stimulus to do something. But, you know, if you're used to doing a thousand curls a day with a hundred pound dumbbells, will that one thing do anything? No, because it's not creating a delta it, or it would create a delta, but backwards. It would be a regressive delta. It wouldn't be very good for you. So always remember, it's not how much work you're doing. It's whether or not you're creating that delta. How am I doing now creating a progressive stimulus from what I was doing last week? And that's the answer for whether or not it's going to be effective or not. Awesome question, Dr. Barr. Thank you very much. Matt C. saying, uh, following up again, deadlifts are high risk. Uh, RDL, good morning. GHD, back extension are better. I would argue I'm not a big fan of good mornings because, again, it's the risk factor, right? You're fundamentally, you're getting a hip hinge, but you got the bar on your back. So if you go down and suddenly your ability to extend your hips is compromised, where do you go? Where does it, I mean, do you dump it off your back? Do you roll it off the back of your neck and, and stuff? It's just one of those things that has an unnecessary risk to it. I know you could, you could have people out there who are like, I've done good mornings for years and it's fine. Yeah, fine. Great. I can ride my bike for the next 10 years and never crash, but there's nothing saying I'm going to ride my bike tomorrow, crash and break my collarbone, right? Cause there's that inherent risk to it. It's a risk I'm willing to accept because I love mountain biking. But when it comes for me to physical training and conditioning, I'm just saying I want the risk as low as possible. I don't want unnecessary risk. If I can get rid of risk, even if it's low risk, I want to definitely do that. Because why have the risk if it doesn't need to be there? Good points. Uh, it's following up saying uh, squats aren't always the best for the hamstrings. There was a time I would have argued, but now I think you're, you're right about that. But that doesn't mean don't engage your hamstrings with that. Remember, with a good squat, you should be pulling towards your thighs anyway. So you should be pulling with those hamstrings in a good squat anyway. And it depends on the squat, too. Things like the progressive calisthenics, like pistol squats and stuff, you're going to get your hamstrings to a larger degree. Uh, Cristobal is saying, thoughts on bulking and training calisthenics. Never been a fan of bulking. Eat enough, my friend. Eat, just eat. You know, bulking basically means trying to get fat <laughs> in many circles. Most people never need to do any sort of bulking or cutting phase. It's kind of a self-perpetuating thing. Like you bolt, so you need to cut. Why are you cutting? Because I bolt. Why are you bulking? Because I cut. Why are you cutting? Because I, no, just eat plenty of food. If you're starting to get fatter, you're eating too much. Bottom line, you know, this past couple of weeks, I've been imbibing and eating too much. I'm a little softer in the middle. I look at that and I'm like, yep, I'm eating too much. And so I brought my diet back down a little bit. I'm not going to build mus more muscle or strength from that. I'm just getting fatter. <laughs> That's what happens when you eat too much. Uh, whoop, excuse me. More. So we're talking about pain. Other little tips that we want. Tension control is a huge one, my friends. Because especially when it comes to joints and stuff, our body can withstand an unbelievably high amount of stress. 
when imparted to it, forces on the body. People are going to have hundreds and hundreds of pounds on their back. Think of like in strongman, those yoke walks and stuff where they've got a yoke across their back. We're talking hundreds of pounds going through the body, through the knees, through the hips and stuff. They're fine. But at the same time, the human body can be easily injured with just a few pounds of stress applied in the wrong way. And martial artists know this for years. And the example to this I always give people is take your wrist, you know, and just twist and bend it a little bit. And, it ta- and my instructor would always, you know, take the class and he was like, look, pinky. And he'd like push like this on my wrist. And I'd be like, ah, 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 you know, you know, wrist lock, ah, gosh. You know, he's like, all right, now take your fist, make it straight and push hard on it. And he pushed as hard as he could. And he's like, fine, you know, because that's how a lot of force along our body works is if we have good alignment, we can handle an unbelievable amount of force and stress through our body. But if we have misalignment, it takes nothing to hurt you, right? You, you step off a curb and you you twist your ankle a little bit and suddenly your ankle's all screwed up versus, you know, I can squat like 900 pounds in a powerlifting meet or something and you're fine. So that's what we want to look at is how is our alignment when we're doing things? And a lot of alignment, similar to a lot of technique, is actually invisible. And that's how well we're engaging our muscles. I was talking about using our back earlier. How well do you engage your muscles? Because our muscles overlap one another. This is basic uh, compartments of my chain training theory. You know, a chain transfers force from one link to the other because the links overlap So when you pull on one end, the force transfers down the linkage. Your muscles work the exact same way because each muscle is a finite length to it. It has an origin and an insertion point, but there's another muscle that runs across it to some degree in most cases, not not always, but usually in some cases, or the tendons uh, will cross each other to some degree. So force transfers throughout our body. So a lot of times when we have pain, and stress in a joint, it's because we're transferring force along a muscle and then it hits a muscle that's not engaging very well and it stops. And we have force going into the joint rather than through the joint because our joints can handle a lot of stress and force as long as it's going through the joint. But when it goes into the joint, it takes very little force to cause pain and injury. So whenever we're doing an exercise in particular, like, oh, I'm doing dips and it's in my shoulders or push-ups and it's in my wrists or lunges and it's in my knees or whatever, we want to kind of look at what muscles am I not engaging very well? Glutes, hamstrings, lats, traps, a lot of stuff on the back of the body is a common culprit. So when we're looking to build resiliency, we want to make sure we have force going through our entire body. And this is why in chain training, I'm talking about Don't train muscles, don't train movements, train your chains. So if I grab onto that pull-up bar, forearms, biceps, shoulders, and my entire back is engaged and lit up. I don't feel like an area is working. It's the entire chain. Same thing with the backside. Calves, hamstrings, glutes, erectors, lats. I'm doing bridges, I'm doing deadlifts, I'm doing kettlebell swings or whatever. Everything on the backside is working not just one little area, because if you feel it isolated, chances are that's an idea that means that something out there should be working, isn't really working as much as we want. Integrate, don't isolate, as I always like to say. Super Prime 117, good to see you. Hey Matt, I have flat feet, knock knees, an interior pelvic tilt. Oh boy, that's a lot of misalignments there, my friend. Um, I feel like all these posture problems are connected and causing me pain all over my body. Yes, absolutely. What exercise would you have me do to correct these? So I know this may seem like a little bit of a cop-out answer, but it does work very well. And it it is a lazy thing on my part as a coach sometimes when I'm doing this. You know, someone will come to me and they're squatting and they're like, oh, my knees come in. I'm knock-kneed. What do I do about that? And I'm like, don't be (laughs) knock-kneed. You know, oh, when I squat, I do this with my, my knees or my feet or my, and I'm like, so don't do that. And I know that's a a bit of a cop-out, but it really can be a good way to address these things because by trying not to do the thing, that's how you train your body. Because fundamentally, training your body is nothing more than trying to make your body do something. So if I'm doing pull-ups and I'm like, I'm trying to get five reps, 
I'm literally just in my brain saying, I'm trying to do five repetitions. And my body is like, well, I can't quite get five reps. I'm like, well, I need it. <laughs> do five. And because you have that demand on your body, that's what ultimately makes your body adapt. So you got that post uh, anterior pelvic tilt, posterior, uh, anterior pelvic tilt. Yeah, very, very common. So that right now, uh, that's telling me your glute activation is probably very low, glutes and hips, because that's indicative of all this. Uh, the, I don't know about the flat feet, but definitely the knock knees, the anterior pelvic tilt, uh, low activation in the abs, glutes, hamstrings. So I, I would go with those hip bridges. You know, if I were you, that's probably where I would start uh, just right now. But, you know, do your squats, but push your knees outwards. Uh, you know, do uh, your plank and posterior pelvic tilt, force that sort of action going on. And if you're like, well, I can't do that with that exercise. Well, then you do an easier exercise. You regress until you find something that you can do without those characteristics. And then you work on not having those types of character. And again, flat feet, I don't, I don't know anything about flat feet. That's an area I don't have any experience in. So I, I'm sorry, I can't help you there. But uh, that may be indicative of the knock knees for sure, because it's collapsing your feet inwards probably. I'm guessing though, I honestly don't have enough uh, knowledge to have a valid opinion on it. But uh, yeah, I would start off with some very basic exercises where you can fight against those types of habits, those behaviors. And then when you're like, yeah, now I can do my you know squats without that. Okay, split squats, lunges, shrimp squats, sort of. I'm working with a guy right now who's got really, really, or had, I should say, really, really poor alignment of things in his lower body. And yeah, we started with box squats, body weight box squats. And even then it was hard for him. So he had very shallow body weight box squat. How easy can you make this? And then we just keep progressing him up and up and up. And now his alignment's a lot better. Still not perfect, but that's what we're doing. And I, I sound like a broken record, you know, don't collapse your knee in, don't collapse your knee in. Next week, don't collapse your knee in, don't collapse your knee, in. you know. I'm just trying to like hammer that home of do the thing better and eventually your body will adapt accordingly. Joseph Bello, hello Matt. I have to figure out how to use my glutes better and my leg workout too. Since I have followed you, I've seen better results. Good, do not have a lot of pain and post uh, soreness is not bad. Very good. So remember that activation of the muscle is a big part of this one, folks. You can only work a muscle to the degree you can engage it. That's rule number one of the hierarchical uh, fundamental process of neuromuscular proficiency. And the fact of the matter is, if you have trouble engaging a muscle at will, your ability to engage it and strengthen it and grow it and utilize it is severely compromised, if at all even possible to begin with. That's why I wrote the book on isometrics and grind style calisthenics and stuff, because without that activation, you're pretty much up a creek. So if you, but the good news is you reverse that, you have better activation, suddenly everything works. <laughs> it's like, dear Lord, you know, my buddy Jason, who I visited in Vermont, had amazing activation of his quads. All he did was run and hike and he had Tom Platt's like legs. And everybody's like, how in the world do you have quads like that? And he's like, cause he feels his quads working, standing up out of a chair. <laughs> he's got huge legs. So that's that neuromuscular proficiency I talk about. We've got to get those muscles on. And glutes are a very common uh, issue with that as well. But And we can always improve it too. Like my lats right now are working better than they ever have. And if you asked me two years ago, like, how are your lats? I'm like, good, I'm really engaging them better. They're a lot better. And now I'm like, oh, now they're really engaging to it. And probably a year from now, I'm going to be like, okay, now I know how it feels to work the lats a lot more. It's always something we can improve upon. It's always something that uh, is something that can be grown and progressed, which is a good thing. Is the better you engage your muscles, the better everything becomes. Ben Ben is saying, hey, Matt, I learned the freestanding handstand push-up this year. Congratulations. Uh, 39 years old. The thing is, I can't get to do two in a row. I'm stuck with one rep without grinding good form. What do you advise? So this is a very common issue with the calisthenics training in general, folks, where someone will be like, yeah, I got my pull-up or I got my freestanding handstand or one-arm push-up or whatever. And they're stuck doing that one exercise at that one intensity. And they're like, I, I need to get more. But think about it in percentages of context. 
right? You need a certain amount of strength and endurance or just work muscular work capacity, as I like to say, which is a combination of strength and endurance. You need a certain amount of muscular work capacity to do one rep. You need to double it to do two. You need 100% more work capacity. That is a huge step up. That's like saying I can go from 10 pull-ups to 20. I can lift 100 pounds to 200 pounds. Okay, that is a huge step up. So you've got to keep practicing the things that you have with a, that require less work capacity. You know, the, the pike push-ups, the handstand assisted against the wall style push-ups, things that you can get a lot more reps in to get the alignment correct, to get your tension control uh, correct and so forth. So you want to make sure those other things are still in your uh, program because you can still make improvements. You, you could give me a pike push-ups and you're like, I can do 20 of these. I'm like, yeah, but I need better 20. I need it to do better 20 pike push push-ups? Are you keeping your back engaged? Are you making good use of your scapular stability? Are you able to really have good tension control in your forearms? You're clawing the floor for stability, all those things. You can still work on the very characteristics with a regressed exercise. And when you improve that regressed exercise, you'll have then carry over and have better with the freestanding one. So don't just practice the freestanding one. You know, it's not like, oh, I got this one exercise for one rep. Okay. I don't do anything else below that. No, you, you keep doing that stuff too and still keep improving those as well. Um, yep, Ben Ben echoing that saying, keep uh, practicing against the wall, absolutely. Man knows what he's talking about. <clears throat> ben is saying, um, I, uh, I'm i assuming this is me, but maybe not. Uh, saying that, Matt, uh, C. I don't train with weights, but I already added pike push-ups. Oops, sorry. Yeah, that is not for me. It's my bad, my bad. I broke my own rule there. Say on uh, dare dia saying if we're doing uh, contrast training with an overcoming isometric, how long does the post activation potentiation last, and what is the most optimal amount of rest time to have between the two exercises? So he's talking basically we've got an isometric and then we've got a regular like dynamic exercise back and forth and stuff. So it depends on the exercise, it depends on the amount of intensity you have with the isometric, and it depends on the duration of the isometric. So there's a lot of variabilities there. It's not going to be as well, it lasts this much amount of time sort of thing. So you're going to kind of want to just play it by ear. But also, as you get more proficient with the exercise, the carryover will last longer too. So this is why we have isometrics as a warm-up and grind style calisthenics is because you can do you know, isometric chest presses and even 20 minutes later, that's still probably going to have better activation in your chest and your triceps for doing things like push-ups and dips. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. Chances are very good you're not going to lose those benefits anytime soon. I, it's not something where it's like, oh, if I don't you know, get the other exercise within 30 seconds, I'm going to lose it or anything. It's probably not something that's going to fade fast enough for you to really concern yourself with unless it's something that's, oh, I, I would even say it's like if you did isometrics in the morning and then you did like push-ups at night, it would probably fade before that. But even then, probably not as much. So you're probably good no matter how you go about it. I wouldn't worry too much about it. <clears throat> All right, so everybody's getting caught up. Thank you very much, everybody, for helping each other out. Let's wrap this up with a couple last tips here. Uh, so a couple of things that I've noticed that help people a lot with avoiding injury and just help with general resiliency, aside from the isometrics, better activation, better alignment, listening to pain, uh, getting it checked out, <laughs> and so you know exactly what it is, getting it fixed, and so forth, is using methods that just allow more movement. Because when we are locking our body in place to a large degree, it's kind of like forcing ourselves to wear shoes that are a little too small, right? We've got these pain points and pressures and friction in the joints and stuff, just these little things that happen, which is why I'm a big fan of utilizing a lot of tools that allow rotating handles. So gymnastics rings, dumbbells, kettlebells, cable machines, you know, things that allow just a little bit of rotation or giving you the ability to go at specific angles when you're doing things. Lately, I've been doing a lot more pull-up work off of my suspension handles. It's, it's a little bit different if I hang it from a pull-up bar, then they hang down a little bit further and suddenly I'm like, okay, I may have to pick up my legs behind me or something so I can get a full hang. 
but it's so much easier on my joints and I can get so much more out of it just because I can get my hands at right the right angle that I want and the width and everything to get it dialed in. And I can have slight rotation of the hands as I'm doing the pull-up versus grabbing onto a fixed pull-up bar. It doesn't mean, you know, fixed items and fixed things is, is necessarily bad, but making more use of these things that you can rotate and twist and have at specific angles that suit your body type and your joints the best. It just makes it easier for, again, tension to flow through your joints rather than into them. So I highly recommend using more of those independent free floating style handled type of equipment. Uh, another point, of course, is just sleep. Sleep is by far the biggest factory uh, factor, <laughs> excuse me, in our ability to recover from stress and strain because life is stressful. Training is stressful. You're not going to avoid stress. We're talking about minimizing stress and having less stress on the body. But the bottom line is you also need to recover from our daily stresses. And by far the most important variable that is sleep. I know there's a lot out there on like, you know, cold water immersion and, you know, massage guns and supplements and all these. Other, that stuff is great, but it's about that much of actual recovery. The lion's share of your recovery by far is sleep. If you get better sleep, you're going to recover better. Full stop. You could have everything else optimized. You could do the cold water baths and you could get your perfect diet and you could have all the supplements and the massage guns and the massage and cryotherapy and all this other sorts of stuff. But if your sleep sucks, your recovery is just going to suck. Bottom line, you know, so get your sleep in folks, make that a priority. I, you know, last week I was being a little too crazy. I was out way too late. I think there was like three or four nights where I didn't get to bed before 2 a.m. several times. And boy, did my body feel it. Everything was stiff and tight and achy and my joints. And I would demonstrate an exercise at the bodyweight gym, get down on the floor. And I was like an old man. I was like, oh, oof, boy, getting down on the floor. Floor's way down there kind of thing. Body felt kind of beat up. Why? I wasn't working out hard. I was partying too much. And I knew it. You know, it's like, okay, that was fun back on track. Like, I'm not going to make that my main lifestyle. But sometimes that's a good little reminder of like, yeah, when you don't get good sleep and you're not treating your body with respect, it hurts. Because once again, remember, pain is Mother Nature's way of telling you you're screwing something up. And boy, I was getting that signal very strong last week. <clears throat> so, Zach or Z, how long should I wait to exercise after COVID? Whenever you can, although... It depends. I mean, I had the long COVID, you know, that went on. So I got COVID January of 2021. I thought I had, you know, avoided it because 2020 was the COVID year, right? And, you know, January or New Year's actually is when I, I was literally like in bed New Year's Eve going like, everybody's out having fun and I'm in bed, I'm sick. And then the next morning, New Year's Day, I literally woke up, drank some, you know, uh, some uh, sweet tea and I couldn't taste it. And I was like, oh, no. Oh, damn it. I've got it. And so I, you know, got tested and I started to recover. And after about a week or so, I was like, good, I'm out of the woods. I just got, I just kind of feel a little more run down. And I felt tired, exhausted and run down for the next six months. The entire ha first half of 2021 for me sucked physically. You know, I would get down on the floor, do one set of pushups and be like, that's my workout. That's all I've got. You know, and that's how I started to really learn a lot about my adaptive training styles because, like, I have no time, no energy, very little strength and stuff for six months, but I got to do something. Well, you, you do what you can with what you have. And that's how I started to really learn about that approach to training. Uh, so the bottom line is uh, don't wait, do whatever you can. Like, maybe that's just some light stretching. Maybe that's going for a, a quick little walk and just hanging from a pull up bar to stretch yourself out. Remember, folks, training is about teaching your body information. It doesn't have to be hard and stressful entirely. It's just saying, I need my body to be able to do something. And that doesn't always mean stressing yourself out to the max. So when you're doing something and you're like, oh, I just had COVID, I just had sick, I've just been injured, you know, stuff, still do what you can with what you got. Forget about optimal. Forget about, oh, I need to be in the best shape. I need to be in perfect health in order to work out. No. If, if, dude, if I worked, waited until I was perfectly happy and healthy and had all the energy and all the uh, time in the world in order to work out, I'd never work out. I've always got something working against me. 
you know, this past year, I moved out here to Denver. It has not been an easy year for me mentally and emotionally. I've been doing uh, a lot of like therapy and stuff. I've had a lot of soul crushing anxiety, not so much depression, but just a lot of stuff that's really held me back all year. And if I waited until I was like, I've got to feel like Superman in order to get my workouts in, I wouldn't have worked out for the past six months. So we've always kind of got something that's maybe working a little bit against us. And so you work around it, you get rid of it when you can, but if it's going to hold you back a little bit, well, fine, it's holding you back a little bit, you know, so you don't have the time and the energy and the equipment or the resources, whatever. So what? You do what you can with what you've got because it's still going to be a hell of a lot more than what you would do otherwise if you weren't doing anything at all. I mean, hell, in that study, people did a dumbbell curl and they still made progress because they were still getting something out of it that was a delta and a progressive delta from what they were doing before. So for me, when I had long COVID, I was like, well, I'm not going to be crushing workouts for, a, you know, I always thought one more week, one more week, I just need another week to recover. And that just kept going perpetually for six months. And so I didn't know it was going to be lo that long, but I was always saying, well, you know, I can't crush myself in a hard blood, sweat and tears workout like I want. So I'm going to work on technique. I'm going to work on tension control. I'm going to work on my mobility. I'm going to work on my stability. I'm going to uh, learn some new programming ways. I'm going to basically make progress when and where I can. And then when I finally came out of that darkness at the end of that tunnel, man, I hit the ground running. <laughs> I was going gangbusters because now I had energy and motivation like crazy. And I had all these other new things that were like, man, my shoulder stability is better. And I got all these new programming ideas and all, all these other things. And whoo, boy, I, I certainly hit the last part of 2021 with a vengeance. But if I had just been like, oh, I'm sick, long COVID, I can't do anything. I would have spent the last half of that year either making up ground, which probably would have sucked, or just giving up entirely instead of just absolutely destroying things, going after it. Uh, ben Ben saying, took me two months at least to get back to the level I was before having COVID. Yeah. So that can happen with illness. It can happen with injury. I guess you could say you were treating the two very much the same. They're going to set you back. They're going to be a hit. Yeah. And I know we don't like to think about this. I know we don't want to admit it that, yeah, sometimes in life, you're going to get dealt a bad hand. You're going to get an injury or an illness or a life situation like me with a lot of the mental and emotional issues I've been dealing with and stuff. And it's just gonna set you back. It's just going to hurt you. It's going to hurt your gains. It's going to hurt your training. It's going to be something that's going to compromise your progress. And that sucks. I know, but train long enough and it's going to happen. Train long enough and it's going to happen multiple times. But the good news is it doesn't have to take everything away from you. It doesn't have to completely compromise you and it doesn't have to make you quit either. You can still make progress somewhere and you can still gain what you can because I promise you it's still worth it. And as always, it is a learning opportunity and you are going to come out the other side better for it. That's one of the things that's kind of kept me going during these difficult times right now is like there's a better Matt Schifferly at the end of this. There's a better me right now. Things or not now, now things are getting better. But, you know, a few months ago, I was like, right now, things absolutely suck. I have no motivation to train. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to have uh, put in any effort for anything whatsoever. Um, it was it was some dark places. But I kept telling myself, yeah, but you get through this. You know, you learn the lessons from this and you're going to be so much better off and stronger and faster. And in the long run, you kind of look back on it and you're like, you know, I'm kind of glad that injury happened or long COVID happened because that's how I learned about adaptive training, you know, and stuff. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a life philosophy I've adopted over the past several years of, you know, why do bad things happen? Well, sometimes bad things happen to help us get to a better place in the long run. You know, if you're a child and you burn yourself on, uh, you know, a, a flame, you know, you see a candle and you go and touch it and stuff. And you're like, oh my gosh, that hurts. You know, in the moment, it feels like the worst thing in the world, but that could set you up for a lifetime of being able to respect and make good use of fire. So you have a lifetime of benefit potentially from that short-term pain. And so that's kind of an attitude that I've had about a lot of things that even things that last a long time, like injuries that last a year, 
in, you know, illnesses that last six months, you know, depression that can last, you know, for months on end and stuff. If you can get out of it some lessons, something you can grow from, you'll be better off potentially for the rest of your life for years and years and years and years and years of benefit. So when you look at it like, okay, short-term cost, even though it doesn't seem like short-term, like I had, you know, this bad shoulder issue for six months, that really sucked. Yeah, but then you learn how to use your shoulders correctly and you packed it down and you actually made yourself stronger. And now you've got better push-ups for the rest of your life. Kind of gives it a little bit more of a, an easier to swallow situation. You know, it sucks in the moment, but you can be ahead from these bad things that are happening, be there injury, illness, or something else. But you've got to be willing to learn from it. You've got to be willing to investigate it, which unfortunately, that means you've got to also be willing to dive into the pain. <laughs> you know, you don't try and mask it over with drugs and alcohol or anything like that. You don't avoid it. You kind of lean into the wind, if, if you will. And if we can do that, we have the courage to do it. We'll get through it faster. We'll learn faster and you'll be better off. But if you keep trying to avoid it, that's how you keep those lessons at bay. And life has a way of continuously giving you the same bad situation if you don't learn your lessons. You know, it's like, oh man, I did these lunges and my knees hurt. And then you avoid the lunges for a while and a few, and a few weeks later, like, okay, good. And then you know, a couple of months later, like I did these lunges and my knees hurt. Like, why does this keep happening? I keep having this injury over and over and over. It's like, yeah, because you're not learning the lesson. Life is trying to teach you something and you aren't learning from it. You're not embracing the suck, if you will. You keep trying to mask over it. So a little bit of a philosophical approach to finish off here, folks. I will uh, answer a few more questions before letting you go here. But uh, thank you everybody for coming on. Uh, Leo is always uh, with his tearing a left trap, gave us time, not doing push-ups and pull-ups. So my a friend decided to teach me on uh, to belly dance. Absolutely. And <laughs> now uh, Spider Pig is just getting better every day. So you can always learn new things. He has a very good point. God, the number of times that people have come up to me and they're like, I used to be a power lifter. And then I was beaten and broken and injured. And then I got into kettlebells. And oh my gosh, that totally changed my life. And it was the best thing ever. So that happened to me, you know, I was getting all beat up from the weights, learn calisthenics. Oh my gosh, this is the best thing ever. So if we're learning to learn and grow from the experience, we can be better off for it. But if we're not willing to learn and grow and investigate it further, uh, we kind of just stay stuck in that rut for an uh, indefinite period of time. So hopefully that can inspire you to do just that, my friends. I do hope so. But thank you everybody for coming on with your questions, for listening and everything, uh, resources that I've been mentioning throughout the episode. Grind style calisthenics, overcoming isometrics, rotating handles, suspension straps, NOSC trainer. It's all down below in the description. Check that stuff out. Uh, thank you very much. It helps to support the channel and keeps the funding for this podcast alive. And I will talk to you folks next Saturday. Until the, then, be fit and live free.